We finished before the midterm on one of these signal encoding techniques, one of the four. Remember, we have data, and we want to send data as signals. So we have two types of data, analog and digital, and two types of signals, analog and digital. Therefore, we have four combinations of how we can map the data to signals. We looked at just one of them last uh, two weeks ago, where we mapped our bits, our digital data, to some digital signal. We saw non-return to zero, invert on ones, which you had in the exam. Uh, the other one in the exam was Manchester encoding, where we vary the digital signal according to the bits. And there are others. What we're going to do today is to look at the other three alternatives, or the other three um, approaches for sending data as signals. For the digital data as analog signals, we'll go through quite quickly. And same with the last one, analog data and analog signals. We'll just give several quick examples for each. And we'll spend a bit more time on the middle one, sending digital data as, oh, sorry, sending analog data and converting analog data into digital. So, digital data as analog signals. For example, we have our data from our computer, zeros and ones, our bits, and we want to send them as some analog signal, say, across a telephone line. How do we map the zeros and ones into some analog signal? So an example, so we may want to do this if we have our digital data and we can only transmit analog signals. So t a telephone network sends analog signals. So you're, it's built, to the, the copper wires that go from your house to the telephone exchange carry analog signals. So many, well, wireless, so microwave systems transmit analog signals. So we've got to send an analog signal, but sometimes we want to send digital data. So how do we do this mapping? We use what's called, a, we use the process of modulation, which takes our data and carries it onto some analog signal. And at the sending point, we have what's called a modulator, and at the receiver, a demodulator. And together, because at one point we both want to send and receive, we get a modem, a modulator and demodulator. Modem converts our digital data to signals within some frequency range. And there are three pro approaches that we have, because we, with our analog signals, remember there are three things that we can vary. If we go back to our very basics of our sine wave signal, the equation was the, the signal equals the amplitude multiplied by sine 2 pi f, the frequency t, plus the phase. Three variables there, the amplitude, the frequency, and the phase. If we change one of those values, we change the shape of the signal. And we will use that to create the signals to send to represent our digital data. That is, when we have a bit zero, we'll use one of the values for either amplitude, frequency, or phase. And when we have a bit one, we can use a different value for amplitude, frequency, or phase. These techniques are called shift keying, depending on on whether we shift or change the amplitude, the phase, or the frequency, we get amplitude shift keying, phase shift keying, and frequency shift keying. So we'll look at those three, and, in sa and then we'll see that we can, in fact, combine them to be more complex. So remember, we're sending an analog signal. And we're going to change either the amplitude, phase, or frequency of that signal according to the bits that we want to send. That analog signal is, has some frequency. And we talk about the carrier frequency of that signal. For example, when we use amplitude shift keying, we have some signal at a particular frequency, our carrier frequency. So if we just draw that, a sine wave at some frequency, the frequency of this signal is the carrier frequency. With amplitude shift keying, and we'll see a better example on the slide, with amplitude shift keying, depending on the pit bits we want to send, we change the amplitude of the signal. Okay? But we maintain the same frequency. So the frequency is centered around this carrier frequency. And similar with the other two.
This demonstrates an example of the three different approaches, where at the top we have the digital data that we want to send, some sequence just for an example, 0, 0, 1, 1, so on. This is a digital signal with non res turn to zero level to represent that. Ignore that digital signal, that's, that's what we did uh, before the midterm. And here are examples of three analog signals which carry that sequence of bits. And they differ by whether we change the amplitude, A, the frequency, or the phase, P, here. First look at amplitude shift keying. Here we have a very simple scheme. When we want to send a bit zero, we use one amplitude for our signal. And when we want to send bit one, we use a different amplitude of our signal. Where in fact, in this example, bit zero, the amplitude is zero. So, the amplitude when we want to send bit zero in the example is in fact zero. And even though there's no scale shown on here, but assume this is plus one and minus one, then our scheme is to send a bit one, the amplitude should be one. So what I do at the transmitter, I generate a signal of some frequency, the carrier frequency. It's fixed. When we have a bit zero to send, I change the amplitude of that signal to be zero. In fact, so there's no signal there. And when I have a bit one to send, I change the amplitude of my signal, my carrier signal, to be one. And we get this. And we just keep changing the amplitude according to the bits that we want to send. And simply the receiver receives the signal and measures the amplitude. If the amplitude is zero, that means it's received a bit zero. If the amplitude is one, or varies between plus and minus one, then it means we've received a bit one. So change the amplitude depending upon the bit that we want to send. So here the subscript represents the bit. So that's amplitude shift keying. And you can see, I think, with the other two, frequency and phase shift keying, we just use two different frequencies according to the bits that we want to send. So in frequency shift keying, the B here means binary. We could also write it here, but it's, it's less common. We'll explain why we refer to binary shortly. We, we can extend this to co cover more than two levels. But here, B means binary frequency shift keying. Binary means we just have two levels here. In this case, we see with bit zero, we have our signal, and we vary the frequency of that signal depending upon the bit. You can see with bit zero, we have a frequency where we have one repetition in this interval, and the same with the next bit zero, one repetition, and with a bit one, we have a higher frequency signal output. We can see we have two, repeti well, yeah, two repetitions in the same period. So, We, can, we could write that if we want to transmit a bit zero, the frequency of our signal, maybe I should do lowercase f, the frequency of the signal is some value. Uh, for example, this is just an example, one hertz. And when I want to send bit one, the frequency is a different value. For example, 2 hertz, double the frequency. Of course, these values can be different. That is, they don't have to be 1 and 2 hertz. So long as the values, the that these two are different from each other, then, and the receiver can just tell the difference between them, then we can uh, decode the bits that are received. Similar, the amplitudes need to be different. In our example, we had an amplitude of 0 and 1. It doesn't have to be, in theory, 0 and 1. It could be 0 0.5 and 1. It could be any two different values. And same with the phase shift keying. 
we see when we have a bit zero, we have a phase. Remember the phase shifts the starting point of our signal. Normally we think of a sine wave goes up and then down. When we change the phase, it changes where we start at time equal to zero. In this case, we've changed the phase, so instead of going up and then down in our sine wave, we in fact go down and then up. And that's what we see here. With bit zero, we have a phase which starts by going down, then up, down, then up. Whereas with bit one, we have the normal phase, or phase of zero, where we go up and then down, up and then down. So we have two different phases for our signal in that case. And we could write that. Remember, phi is the phase if we have a bit zero and bit one. Uh, what is the phase? Uh, is it pi? Again, measured in radians, in the, the phase. Or well, you can convert it to degrees. But two different phases, and that will impact upon the, the shape of the sine wave in this case. So we get two different signals. And again, the receiver receives the signal for some period of time, measures the phase, and maps the phase. If they measure the phase to be pi, they know they've received bit zero. If they measure it to be zero, they know they've received bit one. Or close to zero. That is, with noise in the system, of course, the signal may vary. It may be, not be exactly what was transmitted. But again, if we receive and we get a phase of uh, 0 0.1, then we'd say, well, that's closest to 0 and furthest away from pi, therefore it must have been bit 1. Similar with the amplitude. If we receive a signal with an amplitude of 0 0.9, the receiver would map that to bit 1. If we receive a signal with an amplitude of 0 0.1, then map to bit zero, because it's, we choose the, the value which the received signal is closest to. Because, in fact, our received signal may have noise. It may not be perfect, as in these examples. So there are the simple concepts of shift keying. Change our signal based upon the input bits by changing either amplitude, phase, or frequency. Just a reminder, our that's our original sign uh, equation for our signal where we have an amplitude, a frequency and phase. We can vary either of them to get different shaped signals. Of course, our signals can be more complex than this in real life, but we use the same concepts of changing one of those three values. And in these cases, we're using just two levels. We say have two different amplitudes, or two different frequencies, or two different phases. We can extend that to have multiple levels. We've spoken about this before, that instead of just having one level to represent one bit and another level for another bit, we could have one level to represent two bits, a second to represent another two bits, a third and a fourth level. So we can have more levels. And we can do that also here. I don't know if we have an example. Oh, we mentioned it here. Where are they used? Uh, turns out that amplitude shift keying is quite inefficient in terms of use of bandwidth. So to send our bits at some data rate, it uses more bandwidth than the others. So it's usually not used when we only need to send very low data rates, or we have a lot of bandwidth, like in optical fiber. So efficiency is not so important. Some examples where frequency shift keying is used in telephone lines, so sending data across telephone networks, coaxial cable, radio, uh, wireless transmission systems, and phase shift keying is used in many wireless systems and others. I'll give some more examples shortly. And it's common to extend especially frequency and phase shift keying from their binary versions to instead of having just two levels, binary, have M levels. That is, instead of having two frequencies here, we may have 
a different scheme which says if we want to send bits 0, 0, a pair of bits, use one frequency. If we want to send a bits 0, 1, use a different frequency, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Use four different frequencies of our signal where each frequency represents two bits. Okay? And of course we can extend that to use more levels to and e where each level represents more bits. And the same with phase shift key. Use multiple phases instead of 0, 180, 0, 90, 180, and so on. So we can extend to multiple phases and a one that you may come across a quaternary, Q here, quaternary, meaning four. Phase shift keying where M equals four. So we have four different phases is a common scheme. And we can combine them together. That is, we could have a combination of our phase shift keying and amplitude shift keying. We'd have a scheme where let's amplitude equal to 1 and phase equal to let's say 45 degrees Amplitude equal to 2, phase equal to 45 degrees. Amplitude equal to 1, phase equals 45, 135 degrees. Here's a scheme where we have four different levels by combining variations of both the amplitude and the phase where this would map to two bits that is when I want to send the bits 0 0 I transmit a signal with an amplitude of 1 so A equals 1 and a phase for example of 45 degrees so the phase is 45 degrees if I want to send the bits 0 1 I use the same phase but a different amplitude so now what the receiver does is measures both the phase and the amplitude of the signal and whichever one of the four it's closest to it gets the received bits. So this is a combination of really amplitude shift keying plus phase shift keying. And it's commonly referred to as quadrature amplitude modulation, QAM. QAM where we combine amplitude shifts and, and phase shifts which is commonly used in, in well it's used in many systems that we use today including ADSL we got home internet and many wireless systems and again they don't just use two levels of amplitude and two levels of phase they can extend to an arbitrary number of levels Uh, some examples some cable TV systems use 64 QAM and 256 QAM what that means is that so this this one would be called 4 QAM we have four different levels some cable TV systems use 64 QAM or 256 QAM. What's the advantage of more levels? Increase the number of levels. What does it increase? You had exam questions on this. Increase the number of levels. We get more more combinations of bits and therefore higher data rate we can send bits faster okay increase the number of levels we can 
with the same signal, we can send more bits in some period of time, a higher data rate. So that's the advantage of increasing the number of levels. What's the disadvantage of increasing the number of levels? More errors. Remember that the receiver has some receive value and it needs to map to one of the expected values. The more levels, then the more chance that we'll, if we have noise in the system, that will map to the wrong value. Okay? So increasing the number of levels, in theory, can increase our data rate, but increases the number of errors. So it depends upon how you build your receiver as to what's a, an appropriate value here. So some cable TV systems use 64 and 256 QAM. What was another example that I had? You can buy products that plug into the power points and use, send your data across electricity cables. So you want to have a network through your home, you can send your data across the electrical cables in your home. Uh, data or power ethernet. Uh, what were the values that they use? They use QAM. I just checked some values this morning. They use 1024 and 4096 QAM. So up to 4000 different levels varying the amplitude and the phase. So many different combinations there. VDSL, VDSL2 allows you to send internet across very short distances across copper wires, maybe tens of meters, 100 meters and uses something like up to 32,768 QAM. So different technologies use different combinations uh, of amplitude and phase shift keying. Similarly, we can use different range of, oh, we have different levels of frequencies. More levels, higher data rate, but more errors. So that's the disadvantage. So you need to make a trade-off depending upon the implementation of your system. Uh, we have a couple of quick examples, which I think well, there's no need to go through them. They're just I think we've covered the main concepts there. How? How to choose the, the correct, the best phase and the best amplitude is, requires further study, which we're not looking into. There's some combinations that are, more, uh, that are better than others. Ah, our examples. Amplitude shift keying in optical fiber, frequency shift keying in some wireless systems, radio systems, PSK and quali quadrature amplitude modulation, which is a combination of phase and amplitude shift keying. Wi-Fi, some cable modems, DSL technologies. So that the basics of how can we send bits as analog signals. Vary the amplitude, phase or frequency. Any questions on those shift keying techniques? Yeah, the, the 256 QAM means there are 256 levels. So in my example on the board, there are four levels. So two bits per level. With 256, we'd have eight bits per level. With eight bits, we need our 256 combinations, two to the power of eight combinations there. Yep. Uh, so, so what's uh, the good number of levels to make sure the errors are, are not significant? Well, again, it depends upon the technology. But, I mean, with cable TV, to get the data rates that they require to send standard definition TV, and in fact, even high definition TV in some cases, they've found that 256 QAM is about appropriate. That is, it gives us high enough data rate to send the TV content and low enough error rate such that our receiver can tolerate it. The more levels, the more costly it is to build your receiver because the receiver needs to distinguish between the two different levels. 
it needs to be able to measure the difference between a phase of 45 degrees and a phase of 40 degrees so that the implementation of the receiver becomes more complex as the more levels come. So with current, these are some examples for current technologies. As technologies improve, these number of levels generally can go up. Any other questions before we move on to the next approach? Let's look at sending analog data. So the, before the midterm, we were sending bits. The example then, sending bits, zeros and ones. What if we have analog data like voice, some video, some continuous measurement of, of, some, sig of some data? And we want to send them as digital signals. Well, with we have two options available to us. We take our analog data, and the best example, and the example we'll use, but it doesn't have to be this, but the one example we'll use is audio as analog data. Me talking, for example, I generate analog data. I want to transmit that analog data as a digital signal. So what can I do? I can convert that analog data into digital data convert my voice into zeros and ones. And then, once I have digital data, I can use one of the previous techniques that we've talked about. Before the midterm, we, we now know how to transmit digital data as a digital signal. For example, NRZ, Manchester, Bipolar AMI, and those other schemes. They can take digital data and send a digital signal. So if I convert my analog data into digital data, I can use one of the previous schemes to send it as a digital signal. Another approach I can do, convert my analog data into digital data, and then using one of our shift keyings, take that digital data and send it as an analog signal. Right, that's not sending as a digital signal, but uh, that's we see there's some commonality here in that we need this process of converting analog data to digital data. And that's what we're going to focus on. So if we can convert analog data to digital data, we can send it as either of those types of signals, analog or digital signals, using the previous two sets of techniques. So the question arises, how do we convert our analog data into digital data? How do we digitize our analog input? And I think you know the, the basic approaches. We'll go through one example. We encode that analog data as bits, as digital data. And at the receiver, we decode those bits to get the original analog data back. So we have a, a coder and a decoder, so we get a codec. The codec it converts analog to digital and recovers the digital data from the analog data. Sorry, that should be the other way around. It converts analog to digital and recovers analog data from digital data. That's a mistake. There. That is, at the receiver we receive digital data and we get the original analog data as the output. So a coder takes analog input, produces digital output. A decoder takes the digital input and gets the analog output. So we get a codec. We're going to look at one example of a codec called pulse code modulation. There are others. In the slides, there's another one called d delta modulation, but there are others, many others. Okay? And you would have heard of some of them. We'll mention later. We look at how pulse code modulation PCM is used. So our goal, we have some continuously varying input, our analog data. The goal is to convert that to bits, digital data. Once we have those bits, we can use one of these techniques to transmit those bits as a 
either analog signal or use our non-return to zero, Manchester and so on to convert as a send as a digital signal. So how do we convert analog to digital? This is the basic approach that we use for pulse code modulation. We start with analog data as input, that's here. We can say that that is continuous time and continuous amplitude. That is, if I draw it, some analog input, we know can Analog means it's continuously varying. Digital, we have discrete variations. So, that's not, that's not very good. Okay. For example, some analog input, some continuously varying. That is the amplitude continuously varies and the time we have continuously, continuous variations. What we do in the first step is take samples of that input. We apply a sampler. Yeah. What that does is converts our input, which was continuous in time and continuous in amplitude, into something that is discrete in time, but still continuous in amplitude. That is, and we'll see on the slides, that we record at different points, maybe at this point, here, We take samples of the input. No need to draw this one because it's on the next few slides. We record the value at this point, and then sometime later record another value, another value, and so on. We take samples of the input. So now we have discrete values in time. That is, we have one at one time instant, let's say time one, another one at time two, at time three, and so on. Whereas prior to that, our signal was continuous with time. With those sampled values, we then convert into some, uh, we into a discrete amplitude. That is, what we do is we divide this space our signal ranges between this minimum value and some maximum. Let's set them to these lines. We divide this space into discrete levels. Level one. Let's do it a bit more accurate. In my case, divide it into four levels. One, two, three, four. Okay, so imagine there's a line through there. And instead of recording the exact value here, let's say if this was zero and this was 100, this value may be 63 in a range from zero to 100. Instead of recording the exact value, we map it to one of our levels. For example, this is level 0, 1, 2, 3. It becomes value 2 in our levels. And this is 3. This with falls in the range of level 1, level 0, and so on. So we convert what we originally have as a signal or an input which is continually, continuously varying in time and amplitude. We take samples so that it's discrete in time, not continuous, and we map the amplitude to discrete values, so, uh, which is, we apply a quantizer, we break it into discrete values, so the output is a, something in discrete time and discrete amplitude, and then we map those values into bits, zeros and ones. And the output then is a stream of bits, a sequence of zeros and ones, which is what we want. The input is a continuously varying input. The output should be a stream of bits or a sequence of zeros and ones. 
It's much simpler than it may look in that diagram, and we'll see that through the, the next few slides. So let's go through those steps with an example. We'll do this example quickly, and then we'll go through another example in a bit more depth. The, this is our input analog data, continuously varying with time and in amplitude. And in this example, we have sample points. That is, we record the input value at time zero at the start here, and then some time later, and this vertical line indicates when we're going to take the second sample of our signal, and then the third, and the fourth, and so on. So these are uh, where we take our sample samples. So we can say that there's some period for each sample. Or there's a rate at which we sample the signal. In this case, this is our sample period. So what we do is record the value, the magnitude of our input at this time, time zero. And if we record, you get some value if we have the scale here from zero up to, uh, well, here's the normalized magnitude from zero up to 16. You record here, it's about 1.1. Okay. The next point is about 9.2. So we record that value, which is the continuously varying amplitude, and map it to one of the, in this case, one of 16 possible levels. Okay. Whichever, one, whichever, whichever level is closest to the recorded value. So if the recorded value in this case is 1.1, it maps to the level 1. If it's 9.2, it maps to the level 9. 15.2 to 15. And the approach in this scheme is that anything... Let's write down some example values. Anything with a recorded value between 0 and 1 becomes a level 0. Between 1 and 2, 0 is greater than 0, less than 1. Greater than and equal to 1, less than 2, level 1. 2 to 3, level 2. and 15 to 16, level 15. So if we record the signal at some sample point to be 13.6, then that becomes level 13 in this case. So think on the diagram here, these are the recorded values, and this is a mapping to a discrete level, one of 16 possible levels. We call them code numbers here. Yeah. In fact, instead of referring to as levels, we map to a code number. And this is pulse code modulation. We get some code number. And then, once we have that code number, we can very easily get a binary value. Just convert that decimal value to its binary form. So, decimal 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. 91001 and so on. And now we have our digital data. We've taken this input analog signal or data and we've got a sequence of bits. The sequence of bits is at the bottom of this slide, 001 through to 0010. That represents the signal that you see on the plot or the data you see on the plot. Take samples of the signal, mapping each magnitude to a code number or a level. And then each 
code number can be represented in a binary form. And that gives us our digital data. Then we send that digital data using one of the schemes from before. The steps are described here. We, yep. So you always round down the PAM now. In this case, we're rounding down because we define yes uh, the the uh, the the division of the normalized magnitude into sixteen different levels. The best way to think of it is that we find we divide this space from the minimum magnitude up to the maximum magnitude into levels and the recorded value is given the code number which is closest to the level that we're into. Yeah. How about, let's say, 10.8, why is it closer to 10 than these two levels? It's just the way that here we go from, what, 0 up to 16 uh, and This is in between 10 and 11. And that corresponds to the, if we start at zero, level zero, level one, level two, that corresponds to the 10th level. It fits within the band of the 10th level. Let's see that with a different example, and that may become a bit clearer. So we'll go through another example, which a bit more depth. Before we go through the example, just record two things that we need to discuss further. Is the question then is, how often do we take a sample, and how many levels should we use here? levels or codes. That's something we need to work out what's the best values for them. The example, I'm not sure if you have it in your printed handouts, we'll show it. Do you have an example a bit later? Sorry. Yeah, the example is in your handouts. At the end of this lecture notes, a pulse code modulation example. So a few pages ahead from this one. Wrong one. You have this in your handouts, but let's go through and follow on the slide. It's a bit easier to see uh, what's going on. So here's our input analog data, so continuously varying in time and with magnitude, amplitude. That is, we have continuously going, varying in this direction and also up and down. We have some, assume we have some minimum amplitude and some maximum amplitude. This is just a portion of the signal. Let's say a, a small portion of voice that's been recorded. We want to convert that to bits. So let's divide it so that let's say the minimum is this point is the amplitude. So the minimum possible value is here and the maximum is up to here. And I've put a time scale on this in milliseconds. We'll see the relevance of that in a moment. We're going to apply some different sampling periods and different number of levels and see how that inputs, uh, how that affects on how the input is reproduced at the receiver. So the first case, or the first example I want to go through is say, let's have a sampling period or sampling interval of four milliseconds. That means every four milliseconds record a value. All right, we have our scale here, so at time zero, record a value. At time four, record the next value, eight, 12, 16. Okay, that's for this example. 
we're going to record a value every four milliseconds. And we're going to have eight different levels. Map our space into eight different levels, as I've done here. Level 0, 1, up to level 7. And using that, let's produce the digital data that is output. The first thing is that we take a sample at time 0. If we start at time 0, we record the value here. The absolute value is whatever it is, 1.1 or 1.2. But the level that it corresponds to is level 1. That is, it's within this band. Okay? It's within this band, the absolute value. So it corresponds to level or code number 1. And in binary, we can represent that as 001. Why 3 bits? With 8 levels, I need to be able to represent the decimal number 0 to 7. I would need 3 bits to do that. Okay? So every sample is going to produce three bits of digital data. Three because I have eight levels here. If I had more levels, it would be more bits here. So I record the value. It's maybe 1.136, some absolute value. Corresponds to level one or code number one. Therefore, the digital data output is 001. Sample interval of four milliseconds. At time 4, I take another sample. And I record it's 5 point, well, whatever the value is here, but importantly, it falls within level 6. It's within this band. Therefore, it gets code number 6 in binary 110. OK? So that's all we're doing here. We take a sample at regular intervals and map the recorded value into one of the levels that we've divided the space into. What's the next value? Without looking at the answers in your handouts, what's the next value? Without looking at the answers. At time 8, 8 milliseconds, what's the level? 3. At 8, it falls within this band of 3. Remember, sampling interval of 4, so 4, 8, here, level 3, 0, 1, 1. Okay? And we can continue to do that, and here are the rest of the values. So here's our input analog data. Here's our output digital data. If I want to transmit this to someone, I want to send this analog data to someone, what the transmitter does is converts the analog into digital, as we get here, and transmits this digital data using whichever technique that we have, non-return to zero or even a shift keying approach. We can send digital data using one of our previous approaches. The receiver will receive that digital data and then convert back to analog using just the binary values it receives. We'll see what happens with the conversion process in a moment, but this is illustrated here. At the transmitter, we have our input analog data. It converts to bits, sends those bits across our link or our network. The receiver takes those bits and converts into some output data. We'll see why it looks like this square-shaped in a moment. A simple calculation. How many bits per second do we need to send in this case? Well, we're taking one sample every four milliseconds. Zero, four, eight milliseconds. Every sample corresponds to three bits. So to send this across our network, we need to send three bits every four milliseconds. Assume that it keeps going that is, it keeps going, then we need to generate three bits every four milliseconds and send those three bits every four milliseconds. Three bits every four milliseconds corresponds to 750 bits per second. So to send this analog data across our link, we need to be able to transmit at 750 bits per second. We'll compare that to some other approaches in a moment. 
We transmit our bits across our link. The receiver receives the digital data and now needs to map into the analog output. And this is what it gets at the receiver. What the receiver does is takes the received digital data, 0, 0, 1, and at time 0, it produces an analog output at that level, 0, 0, 1, level 1, and holds the analog output for the sample period, 4 milliseconds. Then, after 4 milliseconds, it takes the next receive sequence of bits, 1, 1, 0, or 6, and produces an analog output at level 6. Level 3, 1, and 2. And then we can continue. This is the analog output at the receiver. Uh, think of it as your, the input is your voice, the output is someone hearing your voice on their mobile phone then what your phone does is produces some analog output on the speaker by varying the level, the output level, for short periods of time. And we can visualize it like this. Compare them. The blue one is the input, the green one is the output. Are they the same? No, they're not the same. Is the output close to the input? Well, you can see the general shape at least. There, it's not exactly the same for sure, but you can see the shape that it, okay, the blue one is low here, then it reasonably quickly goes up to a high level. That's our green one jumps to a high level. Then it goes down quickly to some lower level and then slowly and then down to the minimum here and so on. So we can at least see the shape. How do I make the green output closer to the blue input? Increase the sample interval. Uh, decrease the sample interval. D increase the sample rate. Yeah. So how do I make... So the goal is to make the output the same as the input. Because when I talk, it's the blue one. And when someone hears me say on their mobile phone, it's the green one. And what they hear, we'd like it to be the same as what I input. So how do we make the output the same as the input, or closer? Increase the rate at which we sample the signal. That is, decrease the sample intervals from 4 milliseconds down to 2 milliseconds. What else can we do? Increase the number of levels. Here we have 8 levels. Make it 16 levels. We'll go through two more examples quickly to show what happens when we vary the sample period and the number of levels and see how that impacts on the output signal. So think as an example, the blue one is you talking on your mobile phone. So you generate that as input. The mobile phone has a codec in it. It converts your analog input into bits those bits are sent across the telephone network. The receiver, your friend you're talking to, receives those bits on their mobile phone and the mobile phone, the codec, or the decoder specifically, takes those bits and converts them back by playing on the speaker on the phone some audio output. Where the input is your talking, the blue level, the blue signal, and the output is the green value here. We'd like them to be as close as possible. But of course, since we're quantizing or, and we're digitizing this, we will not get exactly, in practice at least. Let's try some different values for our sample interval and number of levels. In this second case, we reduce the sampling interval down to 2 milliseconds, from 4 down to 2. Same number of levels. We still have 0 to 7 here, but now 0, 2, 4, 6, 8. More samples. And you get these values, you can check, but 0, 0, 1, same as before. Now 1 in between 0 and 4 is 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, and so on. More samples here. Here's the output. We'll compare them in a moment. 
I'll compare all three of these examples in a moment. So this is the output at the receiver. What's the reproduction of the data at the destination is this one. Compare, again, the blue to the green. Well, same shape. And if you can compare back to the old one, it's a bit closer to the blue one, especially at these points. And here is a bit closer. Third case, this two millisecond sampling interval, but increase the number of levels. See what happens here. Okay, we sample at time zero. Instead of between zero and seven, now we have between zero and 15, 16 different levels. So the first value is closest to, le or falls within the band of level two. Yeah. So we get two as the output. In the previous case, the first value mapped to level one. But because we've increased the number of levels, we get a different output value here. At the next point, level six, level 12, and so on. Importantly, because we have 16 different levels, each sample maps to four bits because we need four bits to represent any of those 16 values. From zero to 15, we need four bits. So now every sample produces four bits of output. And this is the reproduction at the receiver. If you, at time zero, two, then at six, and so on. And the comparison between the input, the blue one, and the output, the green one. Now, let's compare all three cases graphically. The case one, and I'll record what we had. So we have case one, four millisecond sample period, eight levels. Case two, two millisecond sample period, eight levels. And case three, two millisecond sample period and 16 levels. And also the original input, the blue one is shown here. Which which of those three cases is closest to the input? Case three, okay. In fact, case two and three are very similar in this example. But we see that at least case one is quite different. You see here, where the blue one's here, the red one is further away. It's not as an accurate representation as the input as the case two and three, which are closer. Okay. So two and three are better than case one. Comparing two and three against each other, we see, okay, maybe around these points, case three is a bit closer. Uh, it's, it's hard to see. You see that case two is flat here, whereas three goes up and down. So two and three in this example are quite similar. It's hard to visually compare them. But at least we can see that case three is significantly different than the others. Increasing the number of levels, so in general, increasing the number of levels and decreasing the sampling period will improve the accuracy of the receive signal, the reproduction of the receiver. The more times we sample, the more levels we have, the more accurate representation we'll be able to reproduce at the receiver of the, our original input. So better quality as we decrease the sample period and increase the number of levels. We get better quality at the receiver. So 
in theory, well, it's not so clear in this example, but in theory, case 3 will be better than case 1 and 2 in this case. What's the problem with case 3 compared to the others? So it will produce better accuracy at the receiver. The, yeah, the problem. Higher data rate. Now, we need to send the bits across our link. The higher data rate we need to send the bits, the worse it is. That is, remember we calculated in the first case we needed to send 750 bits per second. Because with eight levels we had three bits and every four milliseconds we have to send three bits. What's the data rate required in case two? Uh, no, again, someone heard, said it, I think. 1,500. In case two, the number of levels is the same, so this corresponds to three bits per level. This also three bits per level, but we sample twice as often. That is, we send two times as many bits in the same period of time. So the data rate required for case two would be 1,500 bits per second. And in case three, what do we get? 2,000. 16 levels corresponds to four bits. So it's not a doubling here, although the doubling the levels, we just increase by one bit. Okay, four bits every two milliseconds corresponds to 2,000 bits per second. This is the data rate required to send our data. The higher it is, the worse it is for our network or our link. What does that mean? Why is that the case? Think of this example. I have a link between A and B. The capacity is four thousand bits per second. The capacity of my link from A to B is four thousand bits per second. Let's say this analog data corresponds to people talking. So sending some voice signal across the, the link. If we use the codec with case 1, for every person talking we need to send 750 bits per second. Our link supports 4000 bits per second. If we use case 1 we need to 750 bits per second to represent each voice communications. Across that same link we could support, what is it, uh, five parallel voice conversations with a capacity of 4,000 bits per second 5 times 750 is 3750 bits per second if one person talking uses up 750 then five people talking at the same time use up 3750 our capacity is 4,000 we couldn't have a sixth person talking it would be too much. It would go up to 4,500. So with case one, we could support, in this case, five parallel voice uh, communications. With case two, our capacity of 4,000, we could support just two parallel or simultaneous voice conversations. One person talking, generating 1,500 bits per second. A second person talking, also 1,500, total 3,000, capacity 4,000, we couldn't have a third person talking. And similar with case three, in fact it's 2,000, 2,000 gives us 4,000, we could also support two, just. The lower the data rate required to send that data, the better it is for our network or for our link. Because if I pay for a 4,000 bit per second link, 
then the more people I can support communicating, the better. So don't think of this as capacity. Normally with capacity, the higher the value, the better. This is how much we use of the capacity to send that data. And here, the lower the value, the better. The lower the number of levels, the higher the sampling period, the lower the data rate required, the better it is for our network. But the opposite, the higher the number of levels, the lower the sampling period, the more accurate the signal is reproduced at the receiver. So better quality for case 3, better data rate required for case 1. And that's our trade-off that we need to deal with. Choose the sampling period and the number of levels such that we get a low data rate, but we get a high enough quality. So there's no one easy answer there. So the trade-offs. We increase to get better accuracy at the receiver, increase the sampling. Here, the sampling frequency it should be, not the sample period, the sample frequency and or the number of levels. So case 3 and 2 were more accurate than case 1. In terms of the data rate requirements, where we want a low value, it's the opposite. Here, increased sampling, meaning how often we sample. Not the sampling period, but the sampling frequency, for example. Sampling rate. The sample period of 4 milliseconds is a sample rate of, what is it, 250 per second. 250 samples per second. Often we talk about the sampling rate, or 250 hertz. Here we have a sample rate of 500 per second, or 500 hertz. The frequency, the inverse of the period. Sample period, sample rate. Increasing the sampling rate and the levels increases accuracy, but increases our data rate requirements. We need to choose a good trade-off there. If you if we go back to, if you want to reproduce the blue signal perfectly, what do you do? How often do you sample? In theory, if you sample with a, an infinite number of times per second and an infinite number of levels, you, you get the exact blue signal. So that increase the sampling rate the number of samples we have per period of time and increase the number of levels here and you'll get more accurate reproduc reproduction but you'll get a higher data rate because more data needs to be sent to convey that same amount of analog input. We'll come to a theorem shortly, maybe even tomorrow, about what's a good value for the sample period or sampling rate. But let's give one more example to finish for today, I think. And the example is here, and this is, this is one minute of our lecture from two weeks ago. That is, I record our lecture, which is analog input, me talking, and my computer takes that analog input, so there's a cable coming into my computer from the audio system. It's an analog input coming in. My computer converts it to bits and saves that as digital data on the computer. Saves it as a file. So we apply a codec there. And in fact, the way that I record it, I use PCM, pulse code modulation. It's a common technique. This is just one, one minute, zero up to one, 60 seconds, just a portion of some recorded voice from one of our lectures. So 
So we can see the amplitude varying. If we zoom in, if I zoom in on, I'll select some period and zoom in very close. Keep zooming in. We start to see the finer details, and I'll zoom in. We start to see that, okay, over a very small time period, we see the signal varying over time. And keep zooming in. Ah, we see something different displayed here. We see some dots. In fact, what this program is showing, it's showing the what's, what's actually recorded on my computer is the digital data, the zeros and ones, the sample points. What this, this program is showing is an interpretate or uh, showing the analog version of it. What the computer actually knows is just the values at the dots. So each dot represents a sample. So what happened when I recorded the voice, input analog data, the computer takes samples at some rate, records the value and saves that as bo some bits on the computer. And here the, program, the software has just taken those sampled values, these dots, and joined the lines between them to make it look like it's some analog as output. But actually it's a digital data stored here, where each dot is a sample point. And you know, we will see uh, you can see the sample period. It turns out when I record the sample period, and it's shown up here, is 44,000, or the sample rate is 44,100 hertz. That means every one second, my computer recorded 44,100 samples. In this example, the sample rate, 144,100 hertz. 44,100 samples per second. So a sample period was about two, is it two microseconds? You can work it out, the inverse of that. And the number of levels it used and I know because I recorded it, and I've shown it here, is 16, it uses 16-bit PCM. So it uses pulse code modulation, the same as we went through in our other examples, and 16 bits. That is, every sample corresponds to 16 bits. So we could say 16-bit levels or code numbers. Or 2 to the power of 16 levels. That is, between the minimum and the maximum, to divide that into 2 to the power of 16, which is what our 32,000 32, different levels. Not 8 levels, not 16 levels, but 32,000 different levels recorded there. And each sample maps to one of those 32,000 values, which is a 16-bit number. So we have 44,100 samples per second. Each sample corresponds to 16 bits. And the dots here are the values of those samples. And what this file is, it's a WAV file, you know, WAV, a WAV file. And a WAV file doesn't apply any compression. It just records the exact value, the PCM encoded values. How big is my file? Let's calculate how big it should be. We have a sample rate of 44,100 per second. The duration of my audio, if we zoom back out, we have 60 seconds. Okay, just 60 seconds of audio. Every second, we have 44,000... 60 seconds. Every second, we have 44,100 samples. And every sample corresponds to 16 bits. 
multiply them together and you get the total number of bits to represent this audio in a digital form. And then the WAV file simply saves them as a file. It doesn't apply any compression. What is the value? Let's calculate it. Uh, I have a calculator. BC is my calculator. 60 times 60 seconds, 44,100 per second, 16 bits per sample, and I'll convert it to bytes. That is 16 bits per sample to convert, this will give me the total number of bits to convert to bytes, I'll divide by 8. So it tells me to save one minute of audio, I need 5,292,000 5, bytes. I divide it by 8 to convert bits to bytes. So my file size should be about 5 megabytes. How big is the file? The file is this PCM example. It's a WAV file, which simply stores the audio in a file. LS just shows me the file size. The file size on my computer when it's saved is 5,292,044 bytes. We calculated to be 5,292,000. Where do the 44 bytes come from? When you save the WAV file, it adds some small header information to the start, like to store the, um, the name of the audio. Like ID3 tags in MP3, you can store the name of the, the song and so on, similar with the WAV file. So there's extra 44 bytes at the start. The rest is simply the digital data of that one minute of audio, recorded at some sampling rate and some number of, uh, number of levels. Of course, you don't normally save a WAV file. You may save it as an MP3 or some other format. What's the difference? Well, with different codecs, they also apply compression. MP3 uses a similar approach, but in addition, it compresses the information to make it smaller when you save it. But that's uh, a, a different effect being applied. Tomorrow we'll continue and talk about what's the ideal value for the sampling period and come up with some formula that relates our signal with the sampling period. Then we'll finish on this topic and move on to the next topic. Enough for today.